Kia ora everyone, we'll get started now and um, a few more people will be joining us as we go. So thank you to everyone who's joined us so far um, for this session this afternoon or morning, depending if you're in Australia. Um, we're really pleased to have you with us for our session with Chris Gregg, Senior Research Scientist at Princeton University's Anglica Centre for Energy and the Environment. Co Charlie Keeling Aho. I'm a senior advisor in the communications and engagement team at the Commission, and I'll shortly explain how um, this next hour and a half is going to run today. Um, but before I do that, I'm just going to ask Bevan to lead us into this session with a karakia. Uh, kia ora. Ngā mihi nui ki a tātou, i runga i te pāka whakāta a reo nei, a tēnā koutou. I te hui nei, whai a te mātauranga ki a mārama, ki a whai take ngā mahi katoa, tū maia, tū kaha, aroha atu, aroha mai, Tātou i a tātou katoa, i te matua i te rangi, manakiti a mātou i tēnei wā. So in English, I just acknowledge everybody that's in the webinar. And I've said, seek knowledge for understanding, have purpose in all you do, stand tall, be strong, let us show respect for each other, Creator, bless us all at this time. Uh, Chris Gregg, tēnei te mihi nui ki a koe, e te rangatira, a special acknowledgement to you. Uh, kia ora tātou. That's it for our, kar our karakia and mihi. Kia ora. Kia ora, Bevan. Thank you. That was great. Um, before we kick off, it'd be really good if you could please write your name and the organisation or community you represent into the chat box um, while I'm explaining how the session is going to run. Um, and let us know where you're joining us from in the world. Um, it's always really good to see who we have participating in these sessions. So while you're busy sharing that, I'll give you a bit more information on how today is going to run. Um, this is the third open Zoom in our international speaker series, and we're very privileged to have Chris join us today, alongside the chair of our commission, Dr. Rod Carr, and commissioner, Dr. Judy Lawrence, who will both be hosting the session today. Rod is the former vice chancellor for the University of Canterbury, former chair of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, founding chair of the National Infrastructure Advisory Board, and businessman with a PhD in insurance and risk management. Judy has long involved in climate change policy and research in government and local government across mitigation and adaptation and is a coordinating lead author for the sixth Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Review. During the session, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions. Judy will be fielding these and we'll pose them to Chris during our Q&A slot later on in the session. You should see a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen where you can type your questions throughout the next hour and a half. We might not have a chance to cover all the questions, but we'll get to as many as we can. Um, before we get to your questions, we'll hear from Chris, who will be presenting on his work for roughly half an hour, followed by a short discussion between Chris, Rod and Judy. Then it will be your turn to have your say as we work through your questions. If you'd like to speak to each other or share your thoughts, feel free to use the chat. It's always good to see your conversations and it can be a really great space to share your thoughts and any helpful resources. I also want to let you know that we are recording this session, so anyone who's um, been unable to make it is able to watch it on our website again afterwards. I think that's enough from me for now. So I'm just going to hand over to Rod, who's going to introduce Chris and explain a bit more about what we'll be discussing during the next um, hour and a half. Kia ora, everyone. Kia ora, uh, ko uh, Rod Carr aho. Uh, kai whakahaere, hei paorangi, New Zealand's Climate Change Commission. Uh, it's a privilege uh, to briefly introduce our guest speaker this afternoon. Um, Chris Gregg is a senior research scientist at Princeton University, where his research interests have been focused on engineering, business, and social science, understanding and exploring rapid decarbonization and its impacts on regions, industries, and communities. Prior to that, uh, Chris was a professor of chem chemical engineering at the University of Queensland, while he's had a 10 year career in academics or academia, prior to that, he had 25 years of real world experience in industry, where he was involved in construction, energy and resources management and leadership. Chris brings us insights into the world that is unfolding around us as we listen and learn today, a world in which decarbonizing energy production and use must feature prominently in our pathway to a sustainable future. I look forward to hearing from Chris in his presentation, which will last 
about 25 minutes. Chris, welcome. We are in your hands. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, I'll just make sure that the slides are sharing suitably. Yes? Yes, yes looks clear from here. Okay, so uh, thanks everybody again. Um, I'm actually going to speak mostly about this Net Zero America project that, that we completed in December last year, um, led by Eric Larson, myself and Jesse Jenkins, but really uh, a very large team was involved. Um, we would estimate around 15 man, a person years of work that, that went into this. And um, it was motivated by this increasing momentum behind net zero um, pledges around the world, whether that be countries, uh, states or, or, or corporates. And a sense that whilst um, the ambition was clear in these, in these pledges, um, a robust uh, plan, uh, a blueprint um, of just how you would get there seems to be missing. And so, what we tried to do was really put some flesh on the bones of what this transition could look like. Um, I'll, I'll start by going through the kind of approach we took. So, so to begin with, we start with the projected demand going forward to 2050. And in the US, this is articulated by the US Energy Information Agency. They have an annual energy outlook that they publish each year. And, and basically they're, they're predicting or forecasting the actual final services uh, that are required um, year by year through to 2050. So by final services, I mean things like annual vehicle miles traveled, uh, annual area of floor space heating um, and so on. And so we start with that point up uh, uh, sort of projection. And then what we do is we actually uh, you choose the technologies that would meet that end use. So whether that's uh, fuel vehicles or, or electric vehicles or um, natural gas heating for, for, for buildings or, um, or, or electric heat source, uh, air source heat pumps, et cetera. And so what we do there is build out this projection of both final services and then energy uh, carriers that would meet that demand and we do that through a, through a model called energy pathways. And then what we do is optimize the supply side to deliver on those services. And we do that through a, a lowest cost uh, approach. So basically our approach to lowest cost is um, to provide the lowest overall NPV um, for the technologies that are available uh, of, the, of the energy transition um, and following a linear trajectory on CO2 from where it is today to net zero uh, by 2050. So, you know, we accept that linear is not the pathway that will be followed, but it's one possible pathway. Now, that's kind of pretty typical of a lot of these um, systems level, quite high level modeling exercises. The real value in what we did was this last step here, which was done kind of, uh, post uh, facto outside the model where we downscaled and essentially took the sort of more coarse 14 region models that were uh, generating the energy demands and the energy supplies, and then downscaled that by essentially siting all of the energy infrastructure, all of the plant, all of the supporting infrastructure on both the supply and demand side at a, at a state and even county level. Um, so that this gave us a real picture of what the, um, what the, what the uh, transition looks like on the ground over time, and therefore what the various impacts and implications would be, which were important to understand the impacts on landscapes, communities, et cetera. So that's kind of the overall process we followed. Um, just to put it in perspective, so this gives you a, a picture of the 14 regions. So the energy system modeling is done at those 14 regions. The downscaling is done down to these individual counties within. So, so I guess the first step is, is how do we build these pathways? And, and, and essentially what we found is that there are six pillars of deep decarbonization that are essential for any nation or organization going to net zero. 
The first is energy productivity, which we, we get through a combination of uh, efficiency gains, but also electrification. So electrification turns out to provide a more efficient transfer of energy and so helps to contribute to energy productivity. The second one is clean electricity. Uh, so that includes wind and solar and other renewables, um, but they're the two principal weather dependent renewables, but then also firm power. So things like natural gas with CCS or bioenergy with CCS or nuclear. So anything that's always available on demand that can back up the weather dependent renewables along with transmission and storage. The third pillar is um, zero carbon fuels and feedstocks. So some hard to decarbonize sectors like aviation and some of the chemical uh, production uh, systems kind of still need gas and liquid fuels in the future. And so, so we had to provide zero carbon versions of those and bioenergy in, in the case of the US um, played a significant role. And then the fourth one was CO2 capture, utilization and storage. So that plays a significant role in most decarbonization scenarios. And they represent the, uh, the energy and industrial sectors. And then of course we have to reduce non-CO2 emissions. So biogenic methane, et cetera, and do what we can to enhance natural land seeks. I'm gonna focus mostly on the energy and industrial sector. In the case of our study in the US, we hired um, expert, we got expert elicitation of what was possible in reducing non-CO2 emissions and the, the enhancing natural land sinks. And we got a range of possibilities for the future there. And we exogenously imposed a kind of a, a central case. Um, and then we, we did our optimization and our downscaling really around the first four pillars. So those four there. Um, so to our scenarios. Now, I, I mentioned that we do a cost optimization uh, um, or a net present cost optimization. One of the things that we were anxious to, to acknowledge was there was a high degree of uncertainty in how certain technologies might be perceived by communities, um, how rapidly they might be taken up on the demand side, for example, uh, whether there might be political pushback in certain communities that have incumbent industries, whether there could be supply chain constraints with rapid expansion of individual technologies. And so we wanted to have a variety of scenarios in which certain constraints that would reflect these uncertainties would, would come to bear. And so on this particular graph at the left-hand side, you have the energy mix, the primary energy mix in the US today, 20, or last year, 2020. So you can see, as we all come to know, that it's dominated by fossil fuels and, and, your, and nuclear energy plays a role, and then renewables and hydro are relatively minor. And then this scenario here is how the um, US Energy Information Agency portrays the future in a kind of a no new policy scenario. So you can see that you get a bit of reduction in fossil, but it's largely similar uh, in terms of structure and makeup to today. The five scenarios on the right all achieve net zero by 2050, uh, and so on a linear trajectory. And you can see the first one, this E plus scenario, is a scenario that that has a higher rate of electrification, particularly of vehicles and, trans and buildings uh, for heat. Um, and the supply side is optimized with minimal constraints. The next scenario is where we say, okay, what if the uptake of electric vehicles and, build and air source seat pumps, et cetera, is not as rapid as we would hope. Uh, and so it's a less high electrification case, but again, the supply side optimized with minimal constraints. And then we took that scenario and we said, um, we're gonna allow some more biomass to participate in the, in the energy supply mix. So the, the, the secret to these four scenarios is there is no new energy crops grown for the purposes of producing uh, um, energy. So what we do is we, we convert existing corn ethanol lands in the US to high yielding energy grasses. Uh, 
and we do what we can to maximise recovery of forest waste and agricultural residues, but we don't grow any, any new bioenergy. In this particular scenario, we increase the biomass production for, for energy purposes to the equivalent of what the Department of Energy produced in, in the US called the billion ton study. So this was an assessment of the cost effective bioenergy or biomass crops that could be available for energy in the US. And so that's that scenario. So again, low electrification, but with the supply side optimized and some additional bioenergy available. And at this end of the scale, we go back to that original biomass constraint and, we, and, we, and the lever we are exploring here is the uptake of renewable energy. So on, on the far right is 100% renewables. So we don't allow any fossil or any nuclear in the system in 2050. This scenario is where the rate of build of renewable electricity, uh, particularly wind and solar, cannot exceed the historical annual maximum that's ever been uh, achieved in the US, which was uh, in 2019, about uh, 35 gigawatts per year. So that was about 20 gigawatts of wind and about 15 gigawatts of solar. And so we try to constrain the build rates to about that year on year till 2050. Now, it's important to acknowledge that we don't actually um, believe or prefer or favour any one of these scenarios. We're saying the, 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 the uncertainties reflected uh, in the constraints that might apply are genuine uncertainties. We are not capable of project, predicting the future. And so the idea was just to display these to see what we would find. So the first pillar I mentioned in, in our makeup was energy productivity. Um, and essentially all of our scenarios involved uh, some level of energy productivity improvement, which was significantly greater than the past. And so if you look on the left-hand panel here, the reference sees energy use relatively the same. So it is getting more productive because it's about 1.7% year on year. That's implicit in this reference scenario. Um, but of course, en energy demand is increasing in the US. So that's why that's what we see it re remaining relatively consistent. But in these two scenarios, we in the E plus scenario, our energy productivity improves to 3% year on year. So that's, that's uh, by productivity, I mean, uh, energy use per unit of GDP. And in the E minus scenario, it only improves 2.6%, but still quite ambitious compared to this one. And the difference between these two is same amount of efficiency gain, but you get more um, benefit from the electrification process in the E plus scenario. And to give you an example of what we mean by you know, high electrification and more modest electrification, the, the right-hand panel shows the uptake of electric um, vehicles in the fuels in the transport sector. So you can see um, in light duty vehicles, for example, we achieve very close to 100% sales of electric vehicles by, by roughly 2040. Uh, and in the, in the slower electric or the less high electrification case, we, we, we basically get to about 90% sales of electric vehicles by 2050. So it's sort of on the same trajectory, but a, but a much, a, a significantly more slow transition. But many argue maybe more realistic. And similarly, we, we have similar arrangements for light duty trucks, medium duty trucks, and you can see hydrogen fuel cell vehicles coming to play here. And then in heavy duty trucks, again, we've got a mix of battery electric vehicles and, uh, and more hydrogen. But, but in all cases, a kind of very rapid ramp up uh, to full, full penetration by 2050 uh, and a slower one. So that's kind of what happens in the, in the, in the uh, energy productivity space. So, you know, some of our um, critics, or really only one sort of source of criti criticism we, we uh, got on the, this particular pillar was that 3% year on year improvement versus what we've done historically, which is closer to one, uh, was, not, was not courageous enough. Um, you know, I'm of the view that it's, it's not timid, it's perhaps not as good as is possible, but it's certainly uh, likely to be plausible and certainly challenging. The second pillar is um, electricity, clean electricity generation. And um, 
A couple of things you see here, um, you see the impact of that high electrification. So all scenarios involve much more annual electricity generation than we have today or that we're projecting in a business as usual situation. So you can see roughly between two times uh, the potential generation that we, that we observe today to as high as four times in the 100% renewable case. And so um, that's a really important part of these scenarios is that electricity generation plays a much bigger role. The other key is that wind and solar are really cornerstones of, of the pathways. Uh, and even in, the, even in the renewable constrained case, this one here, you can see wind and solar expanding quite dramatically um, from you know, maybe 10% uh, of the mix today, 10 to 15% of the mix today to almost 40% of the mix uh, in 2050. But in, apart from the renewable constrained scenario, um, you can see that you know, it's a very rapid uptake of wind and solar. You've got the blue is wind, this is offshore wind, uh, the yellow is, is solar. And by 2030, in all of these scenarios, we're roughly at 50% penetration of the US electricity generation being wind and solar. So that is going to be, you know, a really ambitious, I think, undertaking. In the renewable constrained scenario, you can see that we're talking about um, both nuclear and natural gas with CCS playing a much more significant role because of those constraints we applied on wind and solar. So, so they're the five scenarios as you would see them in the electricity uh, generation sector. Now, I mentioned that we wanted to do this uh, downscaling to get a sense of what this looks like on the ground. And um, so, so I'll talk a little about how we went about this. And I'm gonna focus on the, the wind, solar and transmission picture, but we did a similar process for every sector. And essentially we start with a map of what the system looks like today. So, the, so what you're seeing here is uh, wind generation assets as they're located in the United States today. Uh, and you're seeing population density. So you know, this is um, Dallas, Fort Worth, Georgia, the Northeast, and the gray is the existing uh, transmission lines. And then you can see this amber color here is PV. You can see a bit of that coming into the US, into the West Coast, but PV is relatively small. It's a, it's, we don't have anywhere near the, gen, the capacity of PV in the US as we do wind, but also it has a much higher uh, density. And so it doesn't appear so significantly. Now, overlaying this map of energy infrastructure, which is down to roughly you know, kilometer square uh, siting, we then have um, a series of um, siting exclusions and siting criteria. So uh, terrain, for example, you know, slopes, et cetera, uh, 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 we have maps of those that overlay these. We have um, waterways, we have um, environmentally valuable or sensitive regions, culturally sensitive locations, uh, population density is mapped to the same sort of grid and so on. And there are about 60 of these criteria, military bases, airports, etc. cetera. Uh, and so what we then do is site the infrastructure, um, taking into account those exclusion zones, so you can't site in an exclusion zone, and delivering the energy service at the lowest cost to the, to the location, to the demand location where it's needed, where that lowest cost now has a combination of the um, of the generation cost and the transmission cost. And then we build that out in five year increments and show what it looks like on the ground. And so, you know, we have, we have a very limited time for the presentation today, but in, we jump straight to 2050. And what you can see is really a massive build out of wind and solar. Now this is that E plus. So this is the, this is the, the scenario which has the least constraints on the supply side. And so you can see the Midwest being really um, blanketed with wind. You can see offshore wind in the, in the Northeast and a bit of offshore wind even coming further down the coast and Texas, Northwest. Uh, you can see solar being extremely dense in the Florida area and, and throughout the Southeast and the, and the West Coast. 
Um, and to put these kind of deployments, so this is the spatial uh, uh, extent, but we're talking about 1.5 terawatts of new wind and 1.5 terawatts of new solar. So this is truly, truly massive. Um, you know, three, that's three terawatts of wind and solar. The total installed power fleet in the world today is about five terawatts of any technology. So, so this really is quite remarkable build outs. Uh, and transmission is very significant too. So in this scenario, we build out um, three times the current transmission. So I'm just showing the, the high voltage interstate transmission or inter high voltage interconnectors here. So, you know, truly remarkable uh, deployment rates and obviously um, raises all sorts of questions in terms of community acceptance. Uh, now, just to give you an example of what we can do with these downscaling, we, we can zero in to any particular locality. So this is St. Louis in the, in the Midwest, uh, a location which in Missouri, which is today has virtually no wind and solar in the state. And you can see the main city of Missouri here being really surrounded by wind farms. So that blue, rec those blue rectangles is a generic 80 megawatt wind farm. That's a 500 megawatt solar facility. So you can see the difference in power density of, of these technologies. But we, do, we can do this for any location. So if you, if you go to um, Minneapolis, you'll see, um, you'll see wind surrounding that city. If you go to uh, um, St. Uh, Dallas Fort Worth, you'll see a mixture of wind and solar. If you go to Tampa, Florida, you'll see mostly solar. So the, the value in this kind of work is to actually start the process of being able to visualise what it means for communities and to work out how we best engage with communities to build the necessary support. Um, to be, just to be clear that it's not all about wind and solar, um, the zero carbon fuels pillar that I mentioned, this is a, a picture of the sort of new bioenergy industry that, that evolves in the US. Um, Basically, what we're producing is a mixture of pyrolysis liquids, which are needed for those chemical feedstocks and liquid fuels. Uh, the green is for hydrogen. Hydrogen plays a major role in these transitions, uh, both as a, as a final carrier for use in power and, and uh, heating, but also um, as an intermediate for producing zero carbon fuels. And there's a little bit of power as well. And you'll see here, I'm also showing the CO2 storage basins because one of the critical roles bioenergy plays here when coupled with CCS is to provide um, negative emissions, which turns out to be pretty important in helping get us to net zero given residual emissions in some hard to mitigate sectors like biogenic methane, for example. Um, and a thousand new bioenergy plants that are built here. So, you know, this is, this is a cluster of bioenergy plants in these big circles, that's 16 uh, facilities there. Uh, so, you know, a thousand new bioenergy plants to go with all of that uh, renewable energy I just described. Um, and CO2 capture uh, and tra capture transport and storage also plays a major role. So I've skipped straight ahead to 2050. Um, but with um, 1,600 point sources in this E plus scenario, so that's a mixture of natural gas combined cycle plants, um, uh, natural gas reforming to produce hydrogen uh, in this scenario, but also those bioenergy plants that, that we talked about just now. Uh, cement plants, for example, these blue um, circles represent cement plants that are retrofitted with carbon capture. Uh, and then on the, on the West Coast, you see uh, natural gas combined cycle plants and all throughout playing a significant role for the power sector. So essentially 1600 point sources that are capturing CO2 and, an, and supported with this architecture of infrastructure that helps deliver those CO2 uh, sources to the best sinks in the country. Um, now, this is, this is a billion tonnes a year of CO2 being captured and stored uh, in the C-plus scenario. Now, in the, in the constrained renewable scenario, that grows to 1.7 billion tonnes. So aside from the 100% renewable uh, scenario, um, which has 
six terawatts of wind and solar required. All of our scenarios required a minimum of a billion tonnes a year of CO2 being captured and stored in 2050. Now, to put a billion tonnes a year of CO2 into, into perspective, at, at reservoir press, pressures or pipeline pressures, that's the equivalent of 30% more volume than current US oil production. And so this really is a very large scale undertaking comparable to those very high amounts of renewable energy build out that we talked about and transmission build out, but also comparable to, um, uh, to the bioenergy industry. So, so, you know, every sector has really quite heroic uh, uh, deployment expectations. So that's kind of a very brief snapshot of the, of the kind of modeling and the downscaling. But again, one of, the, um, one of the benefits of this downscaling was to try and reveal crucial kind of socioeconomic impacts. I, won't, I don't have time to go through all of them, but th these are some of the critical issues that I thought would be useful to touch on, uh, starting with employment. So it turns out that all of the scenarios see net employment in the energy sector grow substantially. Um, from anything from doubling in the E plus scenario, the one I've been talking about, uh, to four times in the RE plus scenario. The least growth occurs in that uh, renewable constraint scenario. Uh, but again, you still add about a million jobs to the energy sector. Now, the, at the top level, this sounds like um, a really good political story. As someone who spent his life um, building assets in the energy sector, uh, I fear for our capacity to mobilise the talent that we need to deliver on some of these scenarios, but it's certainly something we need to plan for. The, the other thing that this kind of high level perspective doesn't reveal is that it's not homogeneous. So you can see here, wherever there's yellow or red, it means we're not getting employment growth. Um, and red means we're getting more than 15% decline in employment during that decade. And so there are you know, very significant locations where you see periodic declines in employment. And so there's a question here about you know, social justice and making sure communities are not left behind, but it also raises another possibility that Building, tra building transition scenarios based on cost optimization is probably the wrong approach. We need to also consider, um, I think, equity and social justice issues in the way we site our infrastructure. And I think we can smooth out and even out some of the distributional effects in this with a different approach to siting. Um, and so that's, again, one of the values of this downscaling is to alert us to some of these challenges, both in very rapid, quick mobilisation of, of resources, but also in the decline in certain regions. Um, the other thing we did at this kind of granular level was look at air pollution. And so two things see very substantial reductions in air pollution. One is the, the closure of coal plants, which essentially all close by 2030. And the other one is the transition from uh, gasoline vehicles to electric vehicles. And essentially what we find is that by 2050, we've really cleaned up the air in, in the US, across the country, uh, saving more than 200,000 premature deaths um, and also $2, $2 trillion, more than $2 trillion worth of health damages saved. So, so you know, this is a, a really positive story that helps offset some of the questions about cost. And we get to cost. And I think one of the, one of the somewhat surprising features of our, of our scenario is that the, the transition need not burden us with much higher costs than what we are dealing with today as a percentage of GDP in terms of energy services. So you can see we're spending roughly four and a half percent of, um, of GDP on energy services today. And that holds fairly constant for several of the scenarios and goes up by a percent for a couple of the scenarios, particularly the 100% renewable scenario. Now, we don't get the projected gains in productivity uh, and reductions in cost per unit of GDP that might have been expected in a business as usual scenario, but, but by no means are we talking about you know, a massive burden on society like we saw in 
in previous um, energy crises that we've experienced. Now, so this is kind of a good news story, um, but what it obscures is what I think the real challenge for these scenarios is, and that is that we're talking about capital intensive transitions. So essentially what we're doing is we're trading what we would have spent on future uh, operations and fuel costs for upfront investment in clean energy projects. Um, and so all of the scenarios, all of the zero carbon scenarios are significantly more carbon intensive than business as usual. And again, I'm just focusing on the E plus scenario here, uh, but essentially on the supply side alone, um, we have to mobilize more than $10 trillion. So I'm just showing an, a selection of technologies here uh, on the supply side. I'm not showing the kind of fuels, transportation um, uh, infrastructure, but, but we are, you know, on the demand, on the supply side alone, talking about mobilizing $10 trillion. Even in the first 10 years, we're talking about $2.7 trillion. So that's a, that's a significant undertaking, but, but perhaps even more interesting is this side here, which is the kind of decision equity, right? So this is all the feasibility studies, permitting studies, all of that at-risk equity that, that developers have to put on the table in order to create the pipeline of projects that, that, that feeds this, this big capital spend. And so I think this is a, a, a very interesting uh, part of the mix that, that we should look at in a lot more detail. Um, I, I won't, I'll just make one other comment. I didn't cover it in this, in this particular talk, but I talked about incumbent industries. And one of the things we have to be careful about is, you know, we talked about the coal industry essentially being phased out. Well, that's a thousand coal mines and 500 power plants that get closed by 2030. This has significant implications for localized employment uh, and communities being left behind. Um, for natural gas, for example, all our scenarios see a decline in natural gas consumption by between 45% for the renewable constraint scenario and 100% for the 100% renewable scenario. And so this has implications for the US midstream industry where you've got you know, they are hundreds of thousands of kilometers of pipeline infrastructure, some of which has been built within the last 20 years. Uh, and so there's a real risk here that asset stranding or devaluations or perhaps rising rates for consumers might happen along the transition. Um, so, so just to wrap it up then, um, it's been a fascinating study because as someone who's had 10 years in academia, we don't often do things that really make us a, a real splash, but this has, you know, we've had lead and cover stories in The Economist, uh, The Guardian, um, every major media outlet has, has run big headlines about the study. Um, we've probably given nearly a hundred uh, briefings to um, government agencies, House committees, White House committees, uh, investment banks, pension funds, large energy corporates, large industrial corporates at board level. Uh, and so, you know, it's been quite a fascinating response to this. And I think this sort of first ever uh, really granular approach to sort of describe just what it means for, you know, capital, locations, spatial impacts, landscapes, seascapes, uh, but also at getting be, being able to go down to that community level, the, the mobilization of capital, uh, the stranded asset risks. Um, the, these are things which I think have really heightened the attention to, to this kind of work. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that's the end for me. So with that, I'll stop sharing and would welcome questions. Well, while Judy organizes some questions, let me thank you very much, uh, Chris, for your presentation on behalf of the, uh, the audience who's listening attentively. I mean, obviously one of the links we need to and can make is between your work and research around uh, the American circumstance and obviously the matters and issues that we face in New Zealand. Um, so, so I just ask you one, one starting question perhaps to, to get us going and that is, what are the limitations of this kind of modeling to help 
inform public policy uh, discussions and decision making? So, so what I, the way I would answer that question is I would say the limitations of conventional modelling approaches, so things like, you know, those energy systems and the cost-minimised pathways simply don't give you the insights around the impacts, the implications, um, the land use requirements, the supply chain requirements, the capital requirements. Um, and so I think traditional energy systems models are great for helping nations get create an ambition, but they are not, net, not, a, not net, uh, effective in helping nations chart a pathway for actually executing the transition. And so, you know, for, for New Zealand, um, it'll be a very different set of scenarios, right? Your, your pillars five and six, biogenic methane and the like, will play a much more significant role. Um, you have great hydro resources, um, which the US is not so blessed with. And so, you know, you need the energy systems modelling. It has to be very region specific for New Zealand. But I think if you really want to chart a valid and feasible pathway to get there, you need to do this kind of downscaling and get very granular across sectors, spatially, temporally, uh, look at what assets really need to be built and what barriers to doing that are. Look at the issues of social justice that come from the different scenarios. Um, be really uh, cognizant of the uncertainties that you're going to confront in terms of public reaction to technologies, um, policy decisions, investment decisions. Um, and you really have to, you have to do that hard work is, is my sense. Yeah. Uh, Judy, thoughts, questions from you? Yeah, I, thank you, Chris. That was, um, that was really interesting. Um, the, the question is how this type of modelling um, that you've suggested or you've, you've used in the United States, it's, it's really how, how, do we, how do we shift the, the thinking from the options, the type of options that you've looked at have got quite a um, emphasis on carbon capture and storage. And the, the di there didn't seem to be anything there that was telling us about how that would be utilized. And we have a question from Kevin Rolf here, um, looking at this and, and a couple of other questions actually about carbon capture and storage and the role that they play and the embedded energy that is implicit in the systems that have to be put in place. Um, for implementation. I just wonder whether you could comment on the utilisation end of it and also the embedded energy in the transition. Yeah, so, I, I mean, in, in 25 minutes, we don't get to show all the detail, yeah, but, sure. but all of our scenarios actually involve some level of carbon utilisation, CO2 utilisation as well. Mm -hmm. um, the 100% renewables, of course, has... Uh, 800, roughly 800, 700 million tonnes a year of CO2 being captured and all of it being utilised um, for the production of uh, synthetic liquids, uh, particularly, but also some synthetic gases and feedstocks. So, um, but it turns out that's a more expensive approach to go down. Now, again, all of these are region specific. So we did an analysis of the geologic storage um, capacities in the US, we engage deeply with industry. That won't be the case everywhere you go, right? So, for example, we know that many parts of Asia don't have those geologic formations. Hmm. We know that in Australia, they, they, we have some, but, but they're disparately placed. Um, New Zealand, I don't know a lot about uh, in, in terms of your geologic resources, but that would be one of the constraints that you'd have to apply. Um, so, so, you know, again, I think what, what, what the key is that you have to do each time you do this kind of modelling, it has to be site specific. It has to recognise the particular conditions uh, in the location where you're looking at these transitions. Um, yeah. So, so just to follow up to that, how, how do you frame that information when you're out there talking at a, a local level? It would be useful to understand how, 
you've conveyed uncertainty and also how you've conveyed those um, distributional impacts that you talked about towards the end of your talk. Yeah, so in terms of framing uncertainty, I think, um, you know, when we first started to do this, people, people would say, well, why would you constrain renewables? You know, why should there be any particular barrier to that? Um, when you do the downscaling and you show people the maps, you know, eyes boggle and people go, what? wow, how are we ever going to cite all of that infrastructure? How, how are we going to build out um, transmission system, which is three times today's transmission in the US and get it permitted in time? Um, so I think, um, you know, there, it, was a, it was a difficult process at the beginning to convince people that these uncertainties were real. But then when people then see you know, 100% of new vehicles being sold by 2040, so no new internal combustion engines being sold, or, you know, in a 100% renewable scenario, we're talking about three terawatts of wind and three terawatts of solar and nearly six times the, the transmission system. Then people start to say, okay, I get it. There are some uncertainties. There are potential obstacles to all of these scenarios. And I think that's the... That's the key. That's why even today I, I can't make a preference for one of those because I think a billion tonnes a year of CO2 sequestration by 2050 is hard. But I also think one and a half terawatts of new solar and wind is hard each. And I think three, three um, times the, in, the infrastructure on transmission is hard. And I think getting people to, you know, getting the uptake of 200 million electric vehicles in the US by 2050 is hard. Um, and so, you know, none of us can predict which ones of those are going to be the hardest or easiest or, or how things are going to unfold. Okay. So, Chris, we've got some questions around how you've treated net zero. How do you, de how do you define it? You've got a couple of pillars in your, one of your slides where you've referred to it. Um, how is that modelled through the process? Yeah, so, so it's basically all emissions sources, so including from, from agriculture and biogenic methane, etc. cetera. We, we have um, expert elicitation that we engaged in to come up with what we think is a likely improvement in things like biogenic methane by 2050. And it turns out we have um, a net positive emissions in 2050 looking at the difference between non-CO2 emissions and improvements in the natural land sink. So, so that's about 170 million tonnes in 2050, positive, which means the energy and industrial sectors have to get to minus 170 million tonnes. So essentially what we're talking about is that the, the amount of emissions uh, being continuing to be emitted in 2050 is balanced by sinks. So it's a, it's a true net zero. Uh, it means the energy and industrial sector has to go below zero, which again is kind of why bioenergy with CCS turns out to be pretty important to give you those negative emissions. And for, this, for the want of a, of a different, we just set a, a linear trajectory. So every year we've got to meet energy demand and we've got to meet a certain CO2 emissions um, yep. outcome. Okay, Rod, back to you. So connecting to the New Zealand context and, and a highlight, how, did, how do you go about or how would you advise us to go about building public confidence in modelling in general and, and specifically how have you gone about building public confidence in these models? Uh, look, again, I can only just repeat that the downscaling seems to have been the the, 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 the item that has allowed people to engage with this, right? So people are used to seeing these graphs that show an energy mix over time uh, and a CO2 emissions profile over time going to zero. They, they look pretty, they look smooth, but they don't actually tell you much about what this looks like. So by, by going to the, the build rates of infrastructure, the annual build rates of infrastructure, um, how many electric vehicles have to be sold year by year, um, how many 
internal combustion engines have to be retired, how much capacity has to be built in the automotive sector to supply these vehicles, where are the wind farms going to be located, where are the transmission lines. Going into that level of detail has, has allowed people to see for themselves some of what the future might look like and how it might impact on them. Um, we've generally found that amongst communities, amongst state and county uh, leaders, that we've had pretty positive acceptance for this. And I think there are different folks who, who choose one that they like, right? So there are some folks who believe 100% renewables, that looks fine to me. I don't want any CO2 storage and I don't want any nuclear. And that's fine. Our view is um, what we need to do is keep all options on the table because of these uncertainties and allow everything to compete. And my, my instinct is, and I say this to, to whether it's lay people in the public or, or government officials, I say, I actually have no idea which scenario could unfold. I suspect it won't be any of these, but it might be some blend. Uh, and the best scenario for getting to net zero is the one that you can actually get done. The one that survives all these tests of public confidence and that investors get on board with and, that, and, and so on. Yeah, that leads into another question, Rod, really, doesn't it, about the achievability of, um, of them. And in all your discussions with the the corporates of the world and, and the governments, how achievable do they think these are? Have they got particular views about that? You know, I, um, I think it varies depending on who, you, who you're talking to. I think um, most people uh, have, have looked at it and said, okay, at least we now have a kind of a, a robust picture of what this could, what, what it would take and, and what we need to do to be part of that. I think there are some corporates, unsurprisingly, who think, well, it's, it's just too ambitious. We have no, we, there's no way we could get there. Um, and, you know, my view is what they're doing is saying, okay, we believe in this transition still. We just think the timeline is going to be longer, like it or not, right? And there are others who think, well, you know, I want to be a fast, uh, an early mover because I think if I can lead on this, um, there's growing momentum. And there is growing momentum in the US. So I think it's a variety of views. Um, whenever I get asked um, which scenario I like or whether I think this is realistic, I simply say, look, they're all ambitious. They will require heroic efforts from all parts of, of the community, from companies, from financiers and from governments. And if everyone puts in that heroic effort, then anything is possible. You touched on two points that have come up in our draft advice from our commission that's been in public consultation for a period. One is the, the way in which the transition and your focus has been on the energy sector, whereas ours is a little broader on whole economy, but um, the way that that transition maybe has a smaller impact on measured annual GDP than, than might have been expected. Um, and I'd be interested in teasing out uh, whether you were surprised and what you think might be driving that. And also the role that traditional uh, marginal abatement cost analysis could have or should have or should not be used to inform uh, preferencing various pathways and choices? Um, so, yes, to some extent, I was a bit surprised that the, the increase in energy service cost as a percentage of GDP was so modest. Um, now, in, in hindsight... I shouldn't be, right? We've seen massive reductions in the cost of wind and solar and batteries and other things, which really has allowed that to be the case. And so essentially the issue has become one not of, of unit cost of energy supplies, but it's become one of this transition from a operating and fuel cost intensive system to a capital intensive system. So so the problem has shifted from one of being about energy costs to one of capital mobilisation. Uh, now, that doesn't make it necessarily any easier, um, 
but it, but I think it does explain. It's the it's the it's the much much lower cost of wind and solar is kind of central to this um, to this change, um, and and you know it will never come uh, without some cost premium because you know if we only had to decarbonise the electricity sector that would be fine, but we don't. We actually have we still need fuels. We still need feedstocks, um, and uh, as you say, we still have. Uh, non-CO2 emissions and land six to deal with. So, so there's always going to be some cost. Uh, as for marginal abatement curves, um, you know, I think the problem with marginal abatement curves is, is like, like what I said about cost minimization. If the world was, if we, if we had a, if we were master planners and we could make things happen the way we think they should make them, then lowest cost systems would be the way it unfolded, right? Um, but there is lots of issues we face, regulatory constraints, uh, public acceptance, public uptake, uh, siting issues that actually mean the lowest cost solution isn't always available to us. And so I think the preoccupation with marginal abatement cost curves or, or cost minimization modeling, I think puts you at serious risk of falling short. Um, and the other thing I would say about cost minimization or abatement curves is they don't take account of the non-techno-economic domain, right? Things like social equity, uh, environmental justice and so forth. So I think, you know, we've got to, we've, I think cost optimization is a useful metric, but, in, but, but should not be used in isolation. Mm. Judy, back to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, in this transition, there are terrific tensions between preventing premature stranded assets and minimising cumulative emissions, which are really the things that are driving climate change. So how did the modelling manage to pace that with regard to stranded assets? Good, that's, a, that's a great question. I should have said this in, in, in the opening discussion about modelling. So um, what we were doing is, is optimising on the supply side um, and, and the demand side. And so what we, what we start with is an inventory of all of the existing assets on the supply side and the demand side. So vehicles, for example, and we look at the average age of retirement of a vehicle in the US of 15 years. And so we transition the fleet in a way that when a vehicle reaches 15 years, it is replaced with an electric vehicle, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we minimise stranded assets in that way on the demand side. Similarly, on the supply side, um, natural gas plants have 35 years, uh, existing wind plants, 25 years and so forth. Um, so, so everything has a retirement, a typical retirement age, and so we try to not retire anything before that. It turns out we do re need to retire some coal plants before their useful life. Um, but by and large, we were able to respect the retirement, uh, anticipated retirement lives of most assets, except for, and the thing we don't deal with in our modelling, is the midstream assets. So the natural gas uh, transmission and distribution lines, for example. They, we need them in the system almost to 2050, but they're having declining utilisation. And so the challenge there is not so much stranding, but underutilisation and therefore devaluation of assets. And um, so I think on, on the individual generation and use assets, uh, we, we did a pretty good job of respecting retirement age on the midstream, on the midstream and th those sorts of assets with, that are in decline, it was more difficult. And it, but it's a serious issue. Yeah. Okay, Chris. Um, Rod, have you got any final comment? Um, and then we probably should move on to the audience's questions. Mm. So I, I just had a final um, teasing out one of your themes around carbon capture and storage. And, and obviously, New Zealand has offshore gas fields, which are, um, which are, are being diminished. Um, how feasible is it to do uh, extraction of fossil fuel gas from a gas field to strip the energy out of it and use it in a way that, that enables you to do the carbon capture and re-injection. Is this just hideously expensive, even if technically feasible? Or is the now known technology that, that while expensive, is not prohibitive? 
Yeah, I think um, so. If you, one option you have is um, natural gas reforming uh, to produce hydrogen and CO two, which you can capture the CO two and reinject that in into saline aquifers or or depleted gas fields, etc. Um, that technology is practiced today uh, in a number of locations around the world. Uh, it's more. Ex it's obviously more expensive than hydrogen that you produce, which is not mitigated. Uh, but it is substantially lower cost than hydrogen produced by electrolysis, for example. And so, you know, I think in our scenarios, hydrogen production starts out being natural gas reforming with CCS, transitions to being bioenergy gas, biomass gasification with CCS. And then electrolysis plays more significantly in the latter part of the transition as the cost of electrolysis comes down. So, I th look, I think um, if you have the CO2 geologic resources, and not everywhere does, and even, even if you think you do, you actually have a significant amount of work to do to characterise them, to demonstrate to the public and to a regulator that you can store permanently and safely then it is a valid technology which is um, cost competitive compared to a, a number of other mitigation options. Uh, but it isn't available everywhere. And in, I think New Zealand would have some, but not a lot. And then the final science fiction one is air capture uh, of carbon uh, for the purpose of, of uh, reducing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Technically feasible, affordable, or a bit of a pipe dream? Uh, so it depends who you ask. Um, my own view is that it's technically feasible. We know that. But, um, I think today it is quite expensive. Uh, the analysis I do, it's more expensive than some of the more optimistic views out there. So I think it's going to be uh, somewhere north of $600 a tonne today. Um, there are views that it could get as low as 200. Some people even optimistic about a breakthrough that could take it to $100 a tonne, in which case it, it's potentially viable. Um, but you've got to have pretty courageous uh, views about technology breakthroughs and cost reductions to get yourself down to a place where it is competitive. Um, we need it in, in the 100% renewables case and in the... Uh, slow electrification with no extra biomass taste. We needed some direct air capture because we couldn't quite get to net zero without it. Um, and they are the more expensive scenarios. Cool. Thank you, Chris. Over to you, Judy. Thanks, Rod. Um, we've got a number of questions. Um, one that hasn't been touched on so far is this transition question. Um, and really the question about the institutional changes that have to happen to enable um, a change in the electricity distribution system, for example, you know, the regulatory environments and so forth. W was, were any of those factors um, included within your study? Because that's quite no. a change that would have to happen to redistribute things around the country. Yeah, so, so obviously big investments in transmission um, also significant investments in distribution and storage. Uh, all of those things were included in terms of the cost impacts of those. Um, the capacity of uh, regulators and institutional um, uh, systems to be able to make that happen is something we alert to alert as, a, as a key challenge. Um, mm. But obviously we don't kind of model those, those, um, those resistance issues. Um, I think, to me, the broader questions around institutional models is when you've got this much capital to be mobilised, this much infrastructure to be built, with the cumulative impacts that it is likely to happen, I think we need a new approach to kind of developing, permitting, doing public engagement um, and and getting these, these projects um, delivered. Because today we leave it to uh, project developers to go project by project, 
building sufficient acceptance from a community to get a project over the line and then building that. Um, when you look at the cumulative impacts that we see coming down the line, I don't think the project by project approach uh, and this kind of passive acceptance by communities is going to cut it in the long run. I think it's going to lead to pushback at some point. Uh, and so I think we need a new model for project development, which is much more participatory, uh, the working with communities and governments and, and developers uh, in, in major programs as opposed to individual projects. Okay. Just getting back to the problem we're trying to solve <laughs> and that we probably have about 10 years, if that, to decarbonise, where, where, where are the biggest gains going to be made quickly to bend the curve? Yeah, look, I think, I think um, that's going to be case by case uh, for different countries. They're going to have different, you know, low-hanging fruit, if you like. In, in the US, what we found is that for every scenario, um, there are a couple of common features. One is a lot of wind and solar built out in the next 10 years. Um, two is retire the most carbon-intensive assets, which are coal-based, um, and replace those with the combination of, um, of wind and solar and natural gas with CCS or bioenergy. Um, three is do whatever you can to reduce non-CO2 emissions and enhance the natural land sink quickly. And I think the fourth one would be um, really focus on energy productivity. So efficiency, mm. um, electrification, whatever you can do to reduce the kind of total load you have to produce. Okay. Um, yeah, that'd be my... Yeah. Well, that's helpful. Thank you, Chris. Um, another question here. Um, how much does carbon have to cost to become a dominant determinant of investment or divestment in these industries? And how does, the work in the, how does that work in the market economy? Uh, yeah, look, I, I, I'm pretty um, jaundiced about the ability of the market to, to make all of this happen. Um, you know, I think a carbon price, a sort of an a, a, a economy-wide carbon price is pretty politically intractable, certainly in the US and, and certainly in Australia. And therefore, I think you need um, sector-specific targets uh, whether that's regulation or mandates or, or incentives. Um, I think any of those can work, but they have to be very focused and sector specific. Um, I think if, I, I just can't see a politically plausible carbon price that's high enough to drive the amount of change across all the sectors that we need to see happen. Um, and so I think if we want to find that kind of efficient market steadily increasing carbon price. Great for a gradual transition. We should have started 40 years ago, um, but we didn't. Okay. Now we've got the urgency problem, as you point out. Yeah, yeah, okay. Another question here about raw materials for the new technologies and whether there's been um, your, your, your comments really on the work that has been done and is available for um, you know, rare earth and um, other um, that's a great material. question. Yeah. Uh, that, that really is a great question. And I think, I don't think we yet have a, a robust handle on just what it means for all, for not just rare earths, but and mm. lithium and cobalt, but, but copper, for example. Um, I think there's going to be an enormous demand for these that we haven't quite yet quantified. Um, uh, you know, I was on a call this morning with... Uh, some Australian experts and some Canadian experts talking about just this challenge. And one of the things that they raised was the likelihood that in the next 30 years for this transition, we're going to have the amount of tailings we produce from mining in history, we're going to produce that much and more in the next 30 years. So there's all these kind of environmental challenges as well. Um, and where's it all going to come from, right? So we've, we've, We've mined the most uh, easily accessible places. Um, some, of this, some of this is going to come from increasingly uh, challenging places and uh, where social justice issues are at play too. So I think this is a really big issue. Um, 
I would, I would just point out, I suspect there are enough materials of what we need in the Earth's crust. So the issue is not so much as whether it's there. The issue is, can we bring the production on fast enough to, to meet the needs of this transition? And I don't think enough thought is given how we convert those resources to reserves, to, to production um, in order to meet this transition. And I think that's a place where we need a lot more work. Yeah, well, that brings me to another question, which might be part of that solution. Is it not easier to reduce consumption? Yeah, look, it, it always is. I mean, I think I mentioned there was one criticism that we weren't courageous enough on the, on the energy productivity uh, side. Mm. And that's come from, unsurprisingly, uh, the Rocky Mountain Institute. Um, and, you know, I agree. I mean, yes, it would be better if we would all reduce our consumption and we would go as hard as we could to reduce our, um, our, our demand for all the things that we want. Um, I, I think if that can be the case, that's wonderful, Judy, but we haven't historically shown much evidence of a willingness to compromise on consumption. Um, and so I just think if you if you, leave, if you just count on that, you might be disappointed. Um, but it should, we, should, we should do what we can to incentivise it, that's for sure. Yeah, which I think brings, to, brings us to, you know, what are those things that can, can incentivise? And there's a question here relating to um, the use of time um, or set in stone timelines, if you like, such as a deadline date for something to happen um, which may or may not generate the behaviour you want. And I'm interested in your comment on the degree to which those sorts of um, policy approaches would help or hinder. When, when you say a deadline date for something to happen, um, I yeah. don't quite... What well, do you mean? Phase, out, phase out of um, internal combustion engines, for example. Oh, yeah. Um, which yeah, has been used got, around the world already. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that doesn't necessarily reduce consumption, right? That's, that's just basically accelerating the uptake of a, of a, of a particular technology. Yeah. Um, you know, what's, what would be more interesting is how we motivate people to take more public transport, to ride more bikes, to, yeah. uh, to, to just consume less for air conditioning, heating, et cetera, um, Mm. Uh, look, I, I actually think deadlines on the uptake of electric vehicles or heating appliances um, are the right approach. Uh, I think that's, that is what it's going to take. Um, but I, I'd be more interested in how you incentivise people's behaviour um, to actually consume less, to, to drive less, to, to use public transport, those mm. sorts of things, mm. to use less electricity, less fuel. Mm. Um, and of course, one of the things we hate to talk about is price. I mean, increasing the price of energy would be a great deterrent to um, to reduce the use of energy. Uh, but it's sort of that's politically un, untractable as well, intractable as well, isn't it? You, you know, if you live in the US, um, rising gasoline prices is one way to assure a political revolt, uh, and so. Kind of the one thing that might be a deterrent to, to or, a, an, or an incentive to increase productivity or increase de decrease consumption is something that nobody wants to speak about. Oh, some do. Quite a few here. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. And I do too, by the way. But, I mean, decision makers in power. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's just switch tack for a minute now. There's been quite a few questions about marine energy, um, generally about wave energy and tidal energy and other sorts of um, motion from the from the ocean. Yeah, um, yeah. That, that and and int people are interested to know um, why that's been left out of your um, approach and you know any particular reason or what the value of that is. Yeah, so, so not left out. So basically all the supply side technologies are available to the models um, and they're all uh, costed according to some, some uh, respected reference. So typically, whether it's the, the, the National Renewable Energy Agency and the uh, laboratory in the US, 
which has a current cost and a projection, or Bloomberg New Energy. You know, there's a whole range of resources available that show cost trajectories. And, you know, the, the ocean energy options for the US just didn't compete uh, with the cost trajectories that people have. Now, that's not to say they wouldn't compete in every in, in, in other settings. They, they may well do, um, but they just weren't significant. Um, the, the one that was probably, uh, that doesn't show up in the graph so much because it's relatively small, but it's there, is geothermal. So in the US, it showed up. Um, you know, I suspect in New Zealand, it would show up more. Um, and so, you know, again, it's, it's don't, we should not take what we learn from the US and say that's a blueprint for New Zealand. It's nothing like it. Yeah. Uh, you need to do this analysis with that same kind of rigor and definition for New Zealand, and it'll be a very different set of uh, outcomes, I'm sure. And maybe it would include title. I just don't know about title in New Zealand. Okay. Right. Um, lots of questions here, Chris. <laughs> um, Oh, yeah, there was, there's one here about um, when you did your downscaling um, exercise, often data isn't available to do that. And I'm, people are interested to know what sources of data were able to be used and how you dealt with um, paucity of data. So that yeah, look, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And I think this is... Um, you know, when I, when I flippantly say everybody, every region should do this, not every region has the rich data sets that we were able to start with or, or acquire. Um, and that's one of the advantages. The US does have very rich data sets. Um, you know, the, the, from the, the Geologic Society, um, Department of Energy, they've invested a lot of money in creating these data sets uh, and they're all you know, geo, geospatially mapped at a, at a high level of granularity. Um, we're, uh, you know, we're, we've started an exercise in Australia. I mean, Princeton will take a back seat as a partner and be led by Australian universities. Uh, but the data is not as abundant as it was for the US, um, where we think we're going to manage. I mean, to some degree, we have to do some in, interpolation and, and extrapolation. Um, but, you know, the, the, the next question you've got to ask is, with the data you have available and doing some extrapolation and interpolation, uh, what difference, you know, how, how critical is it to the outcomes that you would, that you would find? Um, we're also looking at some, some similar net zero exercises uh, with partners in Asia. Uh, particularly Southeast Asia, and there I think the data paucity issue is much more critical, um, and yeah. we're still getting our head around how to deal with that. Yeah, okay, thanks, Chris. Um, someone here is asking about um, the high focus on wind and PV in, in your scenarios. Did the modelling generate any values for energy storage that was required to cover the time the weather isn't sunny or windy? Yeah. Um, so, so storage played a pretty significant role in every scenario. So it's um, it's just not as big as some as as we might have expected. So battery storage, for example, typically we deployed around three hundred gigawatts with around six to eight hours of storage uh, duration. So that's kind of you know a couple of terawatt hours of storage. So it's significant. Um, but really what we find is, um, and, and we didn't make any courageous assumptions about very long duration storage, right? And the, and the critical issue that we found for balancing renewables was not so much on the hourly and the four to eight hour, you know, you could find ways to do that with batteries, but it's where you have long lulls in wind. So you can get, you know, multi-week lulls where the wind isn't blowing in quite significant regions of the country. And so that's where um, these kind of firm generation backups really came to play. So whether it's bioenergy or whether it's natural gas with CCS, whether it's hydrogen with CCS, uh, sorry, hydrogen combustion turbines. So even in the scenarios where we had huge capacities of wind and solar being installed, we had almost the same level of firm generation 
install capacity as we have in the US today, but it's running at very low capacity factors. So, so rather than have large coal plants or nuclear plants or, or natural gas combined cycle plants, you have relatively low cost combustion turbines. Um, the, the capital of those is very low. The operating cost is high, but because they're only operating from you know, one to 5% capacity factors, the, the operational costs don't become so burdensome. Um, and so, you know, we found that that kind of mix of several hundred gigawatts of, of storage, but with, you know, almost a thousand gigawatts of boom generation in the mix was kind of the better way to provide both the short duration uh, kind of balancing, but also the long duration uh, mm. firming. Mm. Okay. Thank, thanks for that. I've got one last question here. I think nearly last, then Rod might have a few more um, before we finish. <laughs> But it, it, it's, it's, it's really about how, how to get the job done and you need people, you need skills, et cetera. And we've had some experience with COVID in New Zealand, not being able to get skills to do stuff. And um, I just wonder if you have any comments on, in a post or a COVID era, which will continue for some years, how we can get the job done um, with the skills we have and the connectivity we have with people. Um, again, a great question. And this is one that, you know, it, where there's a, a, a divergence of views between myself as a former practitioner and my academic colleagues, right? <laughs> you know, for them, the, the amount of employment that this transition creates is just all about the good news, right? Mm. It's mm. building jobs, jobs, jobs mm. and growth. For me, it's scratching my head and saying, how am I going to attract, train and retain all of this capability, um, what is it going to do? What drain is that going to have on other sectors? Um, now, the, you know, I, I don't have enough life experience in the US to see how good they are at dealing with that. I know in Australia, whenever we've had a mining boom or, you know, an LNG expansion, we run out of people really quickly. And we find the cost of people going up and we're flying in and flying out. And, you know, it's, it's really challenging to mobilise skills. And I think post-COVID, it's even more challenging. Um, and I don't think we're paying enough attention to the, to the mobilisation of skills um, that's going to be required. Yeah, well, that really leads nicely, Rod, into your experience with developing skills <laughs> in your <laughs> university job and, and so on. Do you want to comment further on that? Yeah, I mean, one of the fascinating things, Chris, is that the, um, the move to more renewables energy involves a series of technologies which are deployed locally compared to the fossil fuel sector, which uh, extracts uh, and then ships energy around the world. So if you think about you know, the, the New Zealand case where our, our liquid fossil fuels largely, not entirely, but largely come from a long way away, I have very few jobs associated with them, either at the country of source or in the shipping or even in the refining and distribution throughout New Zealand. Compare that to the new renewable sources that will displace that, which are local wind farms, local solar arrays, uh, more energy efficiency, more software to drive the grid and the end users, all of which is essentially going to require local labour to replace foreign exchange paid away to foreign suppliers of energy. So th this creates a localization effect where I think the contest for talent is going to be truly cross-border because the mm. solar arrays that you'll deploy in the US are going to look like the solar arrays that we deploy here, except you can't actually deploy them using Chinese labor easily. You have to have mm. in-country labor. So do you expect a rise in nationalism and uh, labor protection strategies as countries compete to decarbonize their own economies, uh, but possibly a bit like we've seen with restrictions on the distribution of COVID vaccine, some of the neighborliness of a free trade world is lost in mm. the quest to decarbonize. And so you keep your rare earth metals for your friendly partners, you keep your talented, skilled labour for your local deployment. Thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, well, I think local deployment for building assets is almost certainly 
going to always be local. I mean, I don't think it's easy for you to import Chinese labour um, mm -hmm. to do that. The question would be around the manufacturing of the actual technology. So, uh, and as you say, supply of resources. Well, we've already seen some of these circumstances playing out. I mean, China last year um, announced a threat to withhold rare earth materials to the US. Mm. Um, and that, you know, they, they supply currently around 90% of rare earth, processed rare earth materials. Um, now, you know, one, there's an Australian company who's built, recently built a rare earth processing facility in Malaysia, which is kind of one of the first significant ones to compete. Um, but I, that same company is now building one in Texas uh, for the Department of Defence. And that is driven by exactly the issue you're, you're saying. People are <clears throat> trying to protect themselves against the, the potential geopolitics of, of, um, of energy technology supply. Um, I also think, you know, right now in the US, I mentioned all of that solar that, you know, 1.5 terawatts of new solar. The reality is in the US, around, only around, I think it's less than 15% of solar uh, cells are actually manufactured in the US. The majority comes from China. That is not part of the plan of Biden in building back better. Um, and so... You know, there will be a, a, a desire to manufacture a lot more of these technologies uh, locally. I think that's that's going to play out in a lot of in a lot of major economies uh, because they'll link climate policy with industrial policy because of the the job creation story. Uh, that's probably not going to be the case for, for New Zealand and Australia. Right, they're just not big enough markets. Uh, we'll need we'll need the labour for for the installation, and I think that in in itself will be a challenge for us. But I think the manufact we're going to rely on imports for manufactured uh, technologies. I suspect. So I shouldn't wait for Australia to rebuild a EV motor vehicle assembly industry for us. Well, no, you shouldn't wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Depends how, how much of an optimist you are. Yeah. Well, look, Chris, I think we're, we're, we're coming to the close, but, but thank you very much indeed for investing your time and uh, sharing your, your talent and experience with our audience. I, I would like to thank our audience and participants for their questions and, uh, and look forward to um, meeting you one day in person. Indeed. And I look forward to being able to travel to New Zealand because it is one of my favourite places to visit. But thank you. It was a great pleasure and I enjoyed the questions as well. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chris. And thanks to Rod and Judy for facilitating such an interesting discussion and Q&A. So we hope that you all have a good rest of your day. Um, but before we close, I'm just going to hand over to Bevan um, for the uh, closing karakia. Amen.